We are in the eschatological teaching of Revelation. We are in chapter 13. And so in our notes, we start with the outline of Revelation. I just uh, give you that each week. And I have, uh, we're in a parenthesis section. Uh, we're still working on this, and we will be for a couple of chapters yet before we get to the, uh, the timeline starts moving forward again. And in this chapter, we are introduced to the two beasts. And this is, where, these are, this is actually a fairly famous chapter. The comment at the beginning says, This chapter deals with Satan's chief instruments for deceiving men and dominating the world during the tribulation period. These instruments are described as two terrible beasts. So we're going to uh, read our text. I'm going to read the first four verses. Then we'll uh, discuss a portion of the outline and then move on and read the next a little bit. And the dragon stood on the sand of the seashore. Then I saw a beast coming up out of the sea, having ten horns and seven heads, and on his horns were ten diadems, and on his heads were blasphemous names. And the beast which I saw was like a leopard, and his feet were like those of a bear, and his mouth like the mouth of a lion. And the dragon gave him his power and his throne and great authority. I saw one of the, uh, his heads as if it had been slain, and his fatal wound was healed. And the whole earth was amazed and followed after the beast. They worshipped the dragon because he gave his authority to the beast. And they worshipped the beast, saying, Who is like the beast? And who is able to wage war with him? All right, so <clears throat> there's uh, quite a bit of stuff in just in these verses. So first of all, identification. We have the presence of the dragon. So this implies a direct connection, of course, with the dragon. The beast that appears is summoned by the dragon. Now, remember in chapter 12, we were introduced to the dragon where he uh, is antagonistic towards the man-child and towards his people, to the people of the woman, which we took to represent Israel. And he is also the one who takes, uh, whose tail sweeps a third of the stars out of heaven. That's a bit of an ambiguous reference. We tend to interpret that to be uh, the fall of Satan and the angels that allied themselves with him. But we have to, have to recognize that some of that interpretation, uh, it's a logical interpretation. It is not, we don't have a um, tremendous amount of biblical data to support it. But in any case, uh, the dragon is identified as Satan in chapter 12. And so here we find the dragon standing on the seashore. And the, the source, uh, sea, the, source, uh, the word sea, uh, there, he saw a beast coming up out of the sea. So this word is um, uh, representative, it's a symbol, it's often a symbol for evil or the abyss in the ancient world. Elsewhere, the beast is said to have come from the abyss, chapter 17 and verse 8. Now note, in chapter 11, we identified the beast out of the abyss, seen in Revelation 11, as the dragon, as Satan. Others make them one and the same. So there's a little confusion on that point, but I'm just mentioning it in case you've heard something different. Anyway, Revelation 17:15 identifies the sea as the nations, the sea of humanity. And uh, Walverd says that makes this beast a Gentile. The, the beast is a Gentile. And uh, the, uh, he's coming up out of the sea, out of the nations. Now, <clears throat> uh, there are others who will interpret that he is a Jew because he is the Antichrist, takes the place of Christ. Uh, for the Jews to accept him as the Messiah, he would have to be a Jew. So, uh, we just, those are things that we don't have absolute definitions on. We're just making logical conclusions from the data we have. Christy, go ahead. Yes, that, that's a possibility. Christie's saying that the Jews are dispersed, dispersed through the whole world. So you, he could be a Jew coming up out of the nations. Um, it is a, you know, it's an open question, and it's not one that I'm going to hang my hat on as to whether, which way is correct. But um, uh, it is clear it, when we see that uh, there are certain references that do seem to symbolize the nations. The sea is one of them. 
And uh, there's others that talk about the isles of the sea. That refer represents the nations. That's in, in Isaiah. So we do have a certain, there are certain consistent symbols in the scripture. You know, it's a little, again, you're getting tricky when, you're try when you have a symbol that, where we don't have an explicit uh, uh, reference in the text to interpret it. Then we're trying to tie things together. We're trying to use a logical pattern. So some of it, we have to be tentative in the way we hold to it. All right. Now, the correspondence of the characteristics. So we have the ten ha horns, the seven heads. We have the dragon is described the same way in chapter 12 and verse 3. Uh, we, the last empire in Daniel's vision, Daniel 7, 7 through 8, is described as a, as a uh, great beast. He's not defined. He has ten horn, uh, heads and and all of this, and so there's a, there's a correspondence there. So clearly, this vision, whatever the, all these things mean, now we're going to talk about what some of these things mean, but whatever they mean, I think these visions are linked. I think we have to say that. That much we're, we can be uh, somewhat dogmatic on. But what all of these things mean uh, depends on how we interpret it, how we see it. All right, so... A uh, uh, quote here from uh, Walvert, he says, In Revelation 13 and 17, the beast is the world ruler, whereas in Daniel 7, the little horn on the beast was the wor world ruler. And the, uh, the beast is the whole system that rises up uh, that takes the place of the previous empires. So there are some differences between the, the revelations. The blasphemous names uh, equal complete antagonism towards God. Now, interesting, if you notice in verse 2, the beast which I saw was like a leopard, his feet were like those of a bear, his mouth like the mouth of a lion, and the dragon gave him his power and his throne and great authority. So, it's interesting that these represent, or these are similar to the four beasts in Daniel's uh, visions. The leopard, what empire is that? Anybody remember? What's the key fear, uh, characteristic of a leopard? Speed, which represents Alexander the Great and his quick con conquest of the world. All right. Then the bear, that is, remember? You didn't know you were going to get quizzed today, did you? <laughs> remember the bear with one shoulder bigger than another in Daniel? Which Medo-Persia, that's right. So the Medes and the Persians, and then the lion. <laughs> Working your way backwards in time here. That's right, Babylon. All right, Rob, Rob is doing well today. All right, glad we have him here. You read it a few times. All right, so then the dragon equals the beast, the, the great and terrible beast. Okay, so, so we have a composite here. The beast receives his authority, power and authority from the dragon. The beast and his empire are the final manifestation of Satan's plan to rule in the place of God. And this implies that previous empires are also animated by Satan. And I think there is something to that comment. Now, this is, this is an implication. It, I'm not going to be dogmatic on this. But when we see the involvement of Satan in this last world emperor, this last world empire, we see the connection with Rome, uh, excuse me, with, uh, with Babylon, with uh, uh, Alexander, and with Medo-Persia. There is a sense in which whenever there is a, a movement of individuals or, or great nations to rule the world, there is a sense that that is dominated by a satanic impulse. And so we look back into history. It's not just those ones that are mentioned in the Bible, but we do see men who, who seek to gain power for themselves. So you can think about Napoleon Think about Hitler, you can think about Stalin and other figures like that. They are trying to achieve world empire or domination. And they are, in a sense, there, there is, not that they're directly possessed. We're not going to say that necessarily about these men. But they are influenced, they are part of the satanic problem, program, sorry, to overthrow uh, uh, God and to set man on the throne or set Satan ultimately on the throne. So I do think there is something to this, and I think in this instance he thinks he's succeeding. Okay, Lee? Yes. Yes. Right. 
right? Those correspond, I believe, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's a question. Uh, that's the one that isn't, I would say, uh, that isn't entirely clear. There is uh, this representation that three of them are slain, and then, the, and then the, uh, the little horn, I think it is, grows up. So there are certain, like the, the, the visions are not 100% consistent with each other. But the basic concept is that there, are, there, is a, there is a confederation of nations that give their power to one person, he, uh, he becomes the dominant person in the process of time. According to these visions, he, uh, he eliminates three of his rivals to become the, the, you know, the top dog. Uh, and, he, uh, and then he becomes ultimately the one the world worships, as we see in this passage. Um, it is uh, like, I, I'm just giving you basic things that we can understand. I'm not trying to get too close on the details because there are certain details, I think, you know, we just have to wait and see. Yeah, All right. Yeah. 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 I don't. I mean, I don't. Like I say, there are there are similarities, and clearly they're connected. And so the way it's worked out, I mean, I, when you read a more detailed commentary, they will work out a logical way, many of them, of how to interpret this. And I I find some of them quite compelling. The problem is that then you find somebody else who works it out slightly differently, and and his argument seems quite good too. So I get a little queasy about being, okay, so which guy is right? That's my only issue with... with. And and I've heard guys preach Revelation and preach passages like this, and they've been very, very dogmatic about everything that's happening. Then I go and read some other good commentary, and they don't agree with that guy. Uh, you know, so I've always approached prophecy cautiously. I want to identify what I can, but then I'll just let the rest of it work its way out. That's, that's basically the approach. All right, uh, now the uh, verses 3 and 4, the conspiracy. Uh, it says, one of the heads is slain and revived. All right, I saw one of his heads as if it had been slain. His fatal wound was healed. The whole earth, earth was amazed and followed after the beast. This is a significant event that is a part of making his legend, if you will. Uh, this is one way Satan gains the admiration and loyalty of the world for the beast. These heads have been interpreted as nations or as individual rulers. One of them is given a fatal wound, but miraculously recovers to the relief and admiration of all. And this one will become the worldwide dictator. And so the results of the resurrection, are this, uh, this so-called resurrection, are seen in verse 4. They, uh, the people follow the beast, they worship the dragon, and they worship the beast. And this marks the high point of Satan's program against God. Uh, frequently attempted, as I mentioned earlier, but re- will be realized in the future, albeit briefly. This time of the tribulation is a very short time. He's only given uh, three and a half years to be the total dictator of the world, it seems, according to the book of Revelation. All right. Uh, everybody good so far on the rest of this? Any other questions? Okay, so let's move on and read our next section, verse 5. There was given to him, to this beast, a mouth speaking arrogant words and blasphemies and authority to act for 42 months was given to him. So here again is that three and a half year period, the 42 months. And he opened his mouth in blasphemies against God to blaspheme his name and his tabernacle, that is, those who dwell in heaven. It was also given to him to make war with the saints and to overcome them, and authority over every tribe and people and tongue and nation was given to him. All who dwell on the earth will worship him. Everyone whose name has not been written from the foundation of the world in the book of life of the Lamb who has been slain. All right, so what is all this about? Well, authority is given to this beast. The source of authority is ambiguous, but it appears to come from the dragon, the mouth-speaking blasphemies. Ultimately, the authority is from God who limits the scope. Now, that little statement might be a little hard to grasp, but God allows all this to take place. It's not that God orders it, but God allows it to take place. So, so there is a sense that ultimately, whatever authority this person has, it's because God allowed him to have it. That's the point. But it is limited. It's only given to him for 42 months. The blasphemy uh, is uttered against God and all that belongs to God. He mentions that in verse 6. 
antagonism to the saints coupled with authority over every nation will intensify the persecution against believing pe people during the tribulation. Now, again, no, authority over every nation ind indicates that this is yet future. For no dictator has ever had this kind of power. They've tried for it, but they've never had it. And it's interesting to watch people who, who covet power. They want to be the one in charge. I mean, I suppose we all sort of like being in charge. Uh, it, it, is, it is something that, um, that is appealing, uh, whether or not we are in charge of anything. There is a sense of being in authority is an appealing thing. I remember watching uh, years ago, uh, we were watching Larry King Live, I think, for some reason. And John McCain was on Larry King Live. He, this is, he was Senator John McCain at this time. And uh, I, I, I think it was Larry King asked him, so would you like to be president? And you should, uh, the, the lights came on in his eyes. It was just the expression on his face. It was like, you knew that guy wanted it so bad. He could, <laughs> and uh, I, he didn't get it, of course. He did run. He was a nominee at one point, but he didn't win. And, uh, but the, the interest in, Authority. Okay, that, that, well, yeah. I mean, somebody would ask you. Now, none of us, I don't think any of us qualify. Uh, you know, um, but if somebody would say, well, would you like to be pre president or would you like to be prime minister? And we say, oh, well, I'll never be prime minister. Well, I'm not asking that question. Will you ever be? Would you like to be? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I'd like to straighten these people out. <laughs> you know, like, and that, that animation is there. Well, this man... He wants that power. Satan wants that power. He wants to rule the world. He wants to take God's place. That's what this is all about. All right, Lee, go ahead. I sort of got off the notes there. So, and this is a little bit off topic, but you know. people, It certainly does, yes. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. Now, I think I think there are good people who will go into politics with a desire to serve, but they do like the power. Yeah. Okay, they do. Even the good ones, you know. And I rem there's a quote from Stephen Harper when he had a minority government, and they were it was dicey about how long it would last. And his saying was, "Well, every day I'm a prime minister is another day I'm prime minister." He liked being prime minister. You know, I mean, who wouldn't? I mean, there's so many things that would, I would just be, boy, I, there's so many things I would do if I was, oh, man, yeah, I would like it. And I bet you, you would too, even if you would deny it. You can tell me no, and I can say, yes, you do, you would like it. All right, uh, Daryl. Well, that yeah, that's right. Every man would be a tyrant if he could. That's a good one. Absolutely. Uh, Lee. Yes. So is Satan somehow revealed, or is he only He is, somehow I would say that he is revealed in this period. Uh, he is, you know, remember there's a passage, and I forget where it is, that says Satan appears as an angel of light. It might be in Peter. It seems to me it is in Peter, but I'm not quite sure where it is. But there is this, Satan is a deceiver and a liar, and he will be the spiritual power behind the beast. And somehow... The, the worship of the world, there will be a worship. They'll be amazed at this great beast who is solving the problems of the world and they will, they will honor the power behind him. So, yes. Yes, mm -hmm. yes, I believe so, yeah. Yeah, I think it's, uh, it will be a revolutionary in a certain sense, but it will make p perfect sense to those people who are alive in that day. Okay, and that will be the thing to do. You look how easily and swiftly our population, you know, uh, accepted the uh, the rule or ruling of the, you know, the COVID uh, uh, regime, right? The and and submitted to authority. Now there's a few of us who didn't like it, but the majority of people went right along with it, and that's exactly what will happen in the tribulation period. Yes. Yeah. Like, even look at what's doing up there, like he's crushing Japan and 
Yeah. Yes. Yeah, that's right. It's, it's self advantage. It seems their advantage to go along. That's what people generally will do. Uh, Rob. Yeah. So we as Christians, we look to God. Right. We're, we're looking for a, a better city. Yes. Whereas, uh, so when the right person comes along, and has a bunch of the ads for the right people, they don't really look to God. Yeah. They look at the right people, and they look at the right people. That's right. And yeah. So they'll willingly follow the law. Yeah. There is, yes, yeah, and that, that, and that, the fact that he solves these problems, yeah. or at least seems to, anyway, there, there will be, there will be a, a turning towards that, that figure. All right, Lee. I've always found it weird that there always seems to be this like human desire to be ruled, even though you don't want to like necessarily follow the rules. Like looking at like Israel. There is a paradox because it, because in our fallenness we are broken and we we rebel right against authority, but. We also know that we can't really function well without authority. And so, so there, we're looking for a man, and most people would say, well, if I was that man, I, I would solve all the world's problems. You listen to people, you know, when we have conversations about troubles in our country, we have the solutions if they would just listen to us. And it doesn't matter who it is. I mean, you go to Tim Hortons and listen to people talking, and every person there talking about the problems of our world, we, they all are right, and they have the solutions. If the country would just listen to them, Right? So when somebody gains the power and they seem to have solutions, there is a sweeping of the people. So, yeah, that's the guy, and they'll follow him. Anyway, let's move on from this point because we could sort of uh, carry on with this for quite a while. Let's see, there's the worldwide worship from all unbelievers all over the world. It says the believer, there's a description of believers here. It serves to encourage uh, concerning the security of the faithful. So they will not follow him. All right, so we have a warning here. I want to go over to verse 9 and 10. If anyone has an ear, let him hear. If anyone is, anyone is destined for captivity, to captivity he goes. If anyone kills with a sword, with a sword he must be killed. Here is the perseverance and the faith of the saints. Now this is a little bit of a cryptic statement, but there's a warning here to the observant. Um, and there are many, many interpretations here of, of these verses, uh, which seem to indicate that they're yet to happen. Uh, but enough details are given that interpretation is unmistakable once fulfillment occurs. The warning also indicates that the book is written for a particular generation. And you can compare Matthew 24, 15, where it says, Let the reader understand. So here, if anyone has an ear, let him hear. This is a message for the people of the day when these things are happening. Listen. Look at what we have here what the God is saying here. There is a warning to them to be secure. The plan of God will not fail. Despite persecution, the saints will discern and persevere to the end. So that is an assurance that is given in these verses. Despite all of the uh, terrible things that accompany the rise of the beast, we have the, um, we have the uh, assurance here that, that everything is falling out as God has ordered it. All right, any uh, last comments on this first piece, Rob? Uh, just quickly, it uh, ties into Matthew 24 and Luke 21, where over and over again, Jesus says, do not be deceived. Do not yeah, be deceived. that's right. Don't be deceived. That's right. So it, yeah, that, that warning is there, and it, it does call for us to be paying attention. All right, are we good with this? Let's move on to the second beast. And we'll begin in verse 11. Then I saw another beast coming up out of the earth, and he had two horns like a lamb, and he spoke as a dragon. He exercises all the authority of the first beast in his presence. And he makes the earth and those who dwell in it to worship the first beast, whose fatal wound was healed. He performs great signs so that he even makes fire come down out of heaven to the earth in the presence of men. And he deceives those who dwell on the earth because of the signs which was given him to perform in the presence of the beast telling those who dwell on the earth to make an image to the beast who had the wound of the sword and has come to life. And it was given to him to give breath to the image of the beast so that the image of the beast would even speak and cause as many as do not worship the image of the beast to be killed. There's a whole lot of things here. 
All right, so verse 11 and 12, the identification, he appears to be a specific individual like the first beast. So this is another man. He arises out of the earth, unlike the first beast. Uh, in, according to the commentaries, that means he is a, a lesser individual. And, and as we go through the text here, he seems to be a lesser individual because his job is to direct attention to the first beast. Let me just work through this point, Lee, and then I'll let you raise your question. Uh, he may have a gentle appearance, the horns like a lamb, but his voice links him to the dragon. He is subordinated to the first beast, acting in his behalf and under his authority. Right? He exercises all the authority of the first beast. All right? So he, he leads the world to worship the first beast. You see, he causes the earth and those who dwell in it to worship the first beast. And it, this connects him to the first beast as the later mentioned false prophet. And you'll see the references there. Those are the terms false prophet. So we take the first beast to be the Antichrist. The second beast is the false prophet, the one who directs attention and worship towards him. It's his right-hand man. All right, Lee, go ahead. Right, right. He's not a pope, but he's yeah. He's 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 the faithful sidekick. Yeah. He's the guy that yeah, you know, <laughs> you know, you go, you know, you rule kind of thing. All right, Christy. Do you support like the mirror image of God, 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 the devil, the antichrist, and the false prophet? Yes, I think that's. I think there is a. This is an anti-trinity. So there is a, there is an attempt by Satan to set up his own regime. And of course, he's not try. He doesn't. Ha he's he's one being uh, and one person. But he is. He uses these three persons to to substitute uh, as a as a as a replacement for the true God. All right, Ali. Well, it probably makes it more palatable and more acceptable because we do have like there is that sort of ingrained or built-in requirement that there's that there's that there's that there's that there's yeah. Yeah. Yes, we are drawn to that, and and of course, uh, when men don't want to follow God, they are drawn to a to to a uh, uh, substitution for God, to a uh, you know to a false representation. And you look at all the false gods in the world; there are parallels to uh, the gospel story in false religion. And people will say, "Oh, well, see, that just shows." They want to say this. The, the, the anthropologists want to say this shows that. Uh, you know, the, the myth in the Bible is the same as the myths out in the world. Well, that's not what it shows. What it shows is that Satan is constantly trying to counterfeit God's message. He's trying to deceive people. And, um, and so the, uh, this is what the prophecy is saying here. All right, so let's see here. His religious activity, verses 13 to 15. He is uh, performing signs like Moses to confirm his false message. So he even makes fire come down out of heaven. That parallels Elijah. Um, he deceives the people of the earth, leading them to worship and go build a beastly temple. I have in the notes. Uh, let's see, it says there, to make an, uh, uh, deceives those who dwell on the earth because of the signs it was given to him to perform and uh, telling those who dwell on the earth to make an image to the beast who had the wound of the sword and has come to life. So making that image, making a place where he can be worshipped, he is someone who is held up, and he is one that is revered. And so they, they make this uh, place of worship. And then he gives breath to the image of the beast, making it seem to be alive, and using it to persecute those who resist. So that's what we have in verse 15. There he makes this image somehow, and those who don't worship the image uh, are, uh, are going to be, uh, suffer the penalty. And that reminds us of the great image that Nebuchadnezzar was led to make in the book of Daniel. And those who did not worship were to be cast into the fiery furnace. And you know the story of uh, uh, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, otherwise known as Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and how they were thrown into the fiery furnace but survived by the power of God. So in this case, there will be people who will be, uh, they will be called to worship and to, to give obeisance to this image. And yet God will 
uh, and they will be uh, they'll be among the martyrs of the revel of the revelation the tribulation period. All right, any uh, questions on what we've got so far in this section, Lee? Yeah. Yes. Well, there are, okay, let's put it this way. There are, um, Satan does have power. He's not, not the same as God's power, but he does have power. And there are things that have happened. And even I, uh, I have not seen this myself. Uh, I heard a sermon by a man who had been a missionary in Africa. And he told a story about being uh, taken along to some kind of pagan ritual where he saw things that he... Now, I mean, he's passed away now, but he, he, he claimed to have seen people levitating across the ground. And it's like, how can, can you believe that? Well, I mean, I trust this guy. I think he was an honest man. He said he saw it. So the, the point is that Satan does have power. He doesn't manifest it in, at all times and in all ways, and it's always a counterfeit. It's not the same thing as God's power. So when, when, uh, when, when um, the Egyptian magicians uh, made their rods into serpents, you remember that the, uh, Moses' serpent ate the other two serpents. Now that must have been quite a sight. You know, here you are. I mean, can you imagine? There you are. And then Moses picks it up. And I've often wondered, was his rod heavier? You know, after he, like, it turns back into a rod. Is it now three times as thick? I don't know. This is just sort of one of those things. One of those imponderables that is in there. And you sort of, your mind says, okay, uh, I wonder. <laughs> anyway. Okay, Beth? That's right. Right, yeah. Satan has a limited amount of power, uh, but, and God's power is absolutely overwhelmed. But, but God has allows these things to happen because he's, his plan is to demonstrate his absolute authority over all three of these individuals, the beast, the false prophet, and, and the dragon. And so it, it's coming. Uh, Rob's next with a question. Yes. I think is that I've always heard that uh, this is set up in the temple of uh, Jerusalem, the Jewish temple. Is that the same thing? I don't know. I don't know whether that. I don't know. Okay. Uh, it may be. It may be. It's certainly a possibility. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. He's. He is. He is. He is opposing the Jews at this point. So it's certainly a possibility. That this would be part of the thing. I don't know if I am. I've never seen it in a commentary. I have these, you know, I have these weird ways of thinking, and I, I just wonder. I mean, you, can you imagine? You know, you got he's that one that one rod turned into a snake. It ate up two other snakes. Okay, so then he picks it up. You'd think they'd be heavier, wouldn't you? I mean, but you see, I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> it's just one of those things. I don't get it. All right, so let's move on to our next section. Oh, did somebody else have a question? Sorry. No. Right? Even those magicians, they made more yeah. That's right, exactly, yeah. That's a good point. Uh, uh, Daryl says, the, the, the uh, satanic power never does anything that's any good for anybody. So they, when they make more gnats, or whatever, you know, wh why don't they just get rid of the ones that Moses made? Well, they can't do that. God's power is greater. So that is a, that is a point uh, well taken. All right. Let's read the last bit of the chapter. And he, this is the false prophet, he causes all, the small and the great, and the rich and the poor, and the free men and the slaves, to be given a mark on their right hand or on their forehead. And he provides that no one will be able to buy or to sell except the one who has the mark, either the name of the beast or the number of his name. Here is wisdom. Let him who has understanding calculate the number of the beast, for the number is that of a man, and his number is... 666. All right, so this is a very, very famous passage. And, of course, you know it's going to have 
uh, interpretations. Okay, so the, the false prophet causes all, probably all classes rather than all individuals, to receive the mark of the beast. He requires the mark of the beast to conduct ordinary economic activity. Another identifying warning, the number of the beast's name is 666. Now I have a comment here. Uh, hmm, I thought I was going to put one in from somebody else here at this point, but I must have missed it. Anyway, uh, this is Constable. He says, I think that neither the identity of the Antichrist nor the number of his name will be evident until he appears and fulfills prophecy. Then wise believers will be able to calculate his number as well as identify his person. Until then, both aspects of Antichrist's identity will remain a mystery. And I think that's a good comment because you, you may have heard or read of people trying to identify who the Antichrist is. And they will have, and they'll take this number. There are some numbers in the scripture that have symbolic significance. Uh, the number seven is always seen to be a good number. Number six is not quite as good as seven. So people will say six is the number of man instead of the number of God. And they will say that this uh, three sixes in a row represents the per, uh, sort of the pinnacle of man's achievement. Now, I, I don't know about all that. There is something about this that identifies this person. What does it mean? Excuse me, what does it mean to receive this mark in order to buy or sell? Well, it is a mark of loyalty. If you're a good citizen, you will take this mark of loyalty in order to show your support of the government. And in order to be able to buy and sell, your identification card or mark or whatever it is tattooed in your head, whatever it is, you're going to have to have this mark in order to go to the store and get your groceries. All right? Now, the... Uh, uh, the the thing is th that uh, it is it is something that is added to your own personal identification. It isn't, you know, it's not something that is. Um, uh, it's not like you get a special uh, thing from him and it just identifies him. It it ties you in with that person. All right. So you go to the store. Like you've got a debit card right now. You go to the store to buy things. Well. If it's, let's assume it's a debit card, you have, what you would have to do, your debit card would have to have that code added to it to show your loyalty to the regime. If you don't have the code, you don't get to buy. That's the idea. All right, but who is it? Well, it's not Henry Kissinger, I'll tell you that. Okay, some people, I remember in the 70s, oh, Henry Kissinger, look, they had a numerical value to his name somehow. See, it's 666. Well, no, it's not Henry Kissinger. All right, and it's not anybody else that anybody's tried to identify throughout history. All right, I'm going to let uh, uh, Betty pull and running through my database. You haven't been here so long. I'm trying. Well, who is that anyway? Anyway, so glad you're here. Go ahead. Um, oh, the, the crypto. Yes, absolutely. That could be a part of it. And there is a move. The whole well, boy, you. Uh, you know, Mr. Mathematician, he knows all about this cryptocurrency. But you see, cryptocurrency is a, a rising phenomenon that is something that could become a universal means of exchange, right? You don't have to have, it eliminates borders. You don't have to have Canadian dollars or American dollars. You just have to have the crypto, right? Whichever one wins out. Well, that could be a part, exactly. That could, it's, it's not a totally far-fetched theory. You know, the problem is, you know, every generation has a new theory. Okay, so, but it's certainly, uh, it's not, it is, it is uh, within the realm of, of an imaginable possibility. In other words, it, it could happen that way. So it's not totally far-fetched. All right, Lee, go ahead. Right. <laughs> It'll come back to you. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. 
Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Well, I, the, the whole thing of it is there is, and I, I under, I've listened to a few podcasts about it. Blockchain. Oh, I hear what you're saying. Yes, but I don't totally understand what they're talking about. Okay, it's like they're talking a different language. The thing is, however, you can see how something like that could become the means of controlling the people of the world. Okay, because they know where you've been, they know what you're doing, every transaction you make, your, 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 your pass is going through the system. They, know, they can find you. Right? And we're, cl we're close to that right now. You're carrying around a cell phone, they can find you. Oh, yeah, that's even happened. Yeah. 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 That's right. So the... So it's very easy, and it's, it is a bit frightening, but that's exactly the kind of thing that we're talking about, yes. Now, okay, Beth? Uh, they're, they're talking about the ground and like, well, Yes. There's a time limit of what like, the whole thing is controlled, there's a time limit of what you can do. Yes, yeah, that's right. So, we, now we can read up on all these things and get very scared. The thing is, we have to trust in the Lord. The Bible teaches that those who believe in the Lord, as far as we understand it, will not be a part of the world system when all this happens. And so there is, uh, I've often had people, you know, something happens. And I remember back when COVID began and the shutdowns began, I had a message about, uh, is, you know, is this uh, the end times? Is this the, the, the end? Well, no, it's not. Uh, and there's reasons for it. There are things where events like this parallel the, what we see in the scriptures, but they're anticipatory. They're not the actual event. Uh, well, for the actual events to happen, the things that, have, that are clearly spelled out in scriptures will have to take place. They have not yet taken place. So we know we're waiting for this, but it is something that is future. All right, Lee, go ahead. One more thing on the blockchain. There, we could go completely through digital identification, and it could be a, a time piece going 100 years. That's right. That's right. That's a good point. That's a good point. I'll, I'll repeat that so everybody can hear. Lee says that they could go to this whole digital system and we could have a time of peace and prosperity for a hundred years or more before anything happens. So we have to realize what, what we want to look for is what the scriptures say and not be, not, you know, like sometimes people want to build off a conspiracy theory and say, well, you know, they're doing this and they're doing that and they're just going to control you. Well, yeah, but they can pretty well control you right now in many ways. You know, you look at the ancient empires, they controlled their people. They knew how to do it. So, uh, and they didn't, have, they didn't have digital anything. So, uh, so there is, um, we need to be wise about this. There is something here. That it does say, here is wisdom. Let him who has understanding calculate the number of the beast. So there is something. that This is another warning for the people of that day. When, when these events are happening... The believer who's reading these words will be able to figure things out. Yes, Betty. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> All right. As the wife of a mathematics professor, that's what you're you're uh, promoting, and I, I I appreciate that. That's good. It is important. All right. Okay, I think we'll close here at this point. And uh, what we have, I'll just sum up. Oh, I guess I have a summary statement. The dragon and the two beasts represent a counterfeit trinity. The dragon seeks worship that belongs only to God. The first beast seeks to rule the world, which is Jesus Christ's prerogative. The second beast glorifies the first beast, which is a counterfeit of the Holy Spirit's ministry of glorifying Christ. So I think that is uh, what we're seeing in this chapter. We'll move on to chapter 14 for next week. Let's bow our heads for a word of prayer. Father, we thank you for this time that we've had today. We pray that as we study these things, that we will not be fearful. We will just be understanding of what the future is and that our current events are not these events. Uh, we look forward uh, to you returning and calling for the saints, and we pray that that day will come soon. We thank you for all that you've done, and we pray you continue to work in our lives. Help us be faithful servants of yours as we go forward in our lives. In Jesus' name, amen.